Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. And today I'm not going to share with you something about sales, though also as well we work on that. And today what I want to work with you is, or share with you is something about how to develop more robust models that combine mathematical models and deep learning in this era of multimodal data and with minimal learning. And particularly, before to start and delve into this talk, I would like to share with you some other general two minutes about what we do, because this is mainly about multimodal, but I hear the talks and this is something about covering segmentation and so, so I would like to share with you that what we do actually is to develop this new algorithmic approach capable to do or handle vast amount of data in a more efficient way. So before to delve into the talk, I would like to share with you what we do. So there are major holy grails in medical image analysis. One of the first one is the manual parameter tuning. So for instance, every time that you're using deep learning, you need to adjust manually what is the best parameter for your model. So what we are trying to do also on the top of what is the main presentation today is how to do it automatically. Another, another holy grail of medical image analysis is how we can use or develop models that, re that require less data. And this is mainly because in medical domain, having a single annotation is really time consuming and actually is going to be one of the points for the talk today. The next one is, okay, we have these deep learning models, but can we say what is doing the model and it doing explainability and interpretability of the model is another key area in medical image analysis. And last but not least, also as well, you have different data with different devices acquisition. And this is an example. For instance, you take a mammograph and you go to a different hospitals or even different scanners or vendor machines, you are seeing that actually the same mammogram will represent in a different distribution. How to develop this algorithmic approach that are capable to, to generalize well across different type of acquisitions to fit your distributions. And this is what is called domain generalization. Also as well, today, the talk of today will be multimodal data. So more and more you will hear that, okay, we have access not only image data, but how we can use other type of sources of data. And this is going to be particularly the talk of today, multimodal data with minimal learning. Okay, so this talk is divided as follows. First of all, I will start giving a motivation about in this era of big data, what is the need to develop new algorithmic approach. Then I will delve into the tell, show you a case example study that is about something that we de developed that is called uh, hypergraph diffusion networks. So how we can use different type of data, like for instance, imagining, non-imagining data. And when I say not imagining data, that could be, for instance, uh, reports access that you have, demographics, et cetera, of the patient or any patient or user. From there, I will show you some experimental results and close this presentation with the concluding remarks. So uh, usually the way that I like to start my presentation is with a phrase that we hear every day, fix videos, text, or it didn't happen. And this is really true because if we stop for one second to think about the vast amount of data that we generate every single day, it's really mind blowing. Let me give you an example. Everyone is familiar with the social media. For instance, let's take Instagram. More than 95 million photos every single day. And these quantities increasing exponentially every year. But this is not only about pictures, this is also as well about videos, audio text on any kind of imaging of, of data that you can have access. And this is not only about social media, this is this explosion of data, you can see it in different domains. Some other examples are here displayed, for instance, remote sensing, where you want to have some measure at distance. So you have to deal with the order of pentabytes of data, how to handle that. And another domain that is going to be the topic of today is medical image analysis. Every day you go to the hospital or any lab and you can, uh, you can have access about of ten of thousands of data, how we, what we can do with that. Okay, this is a, a good question because even if we have access to this data, does it have value until we pose a particular question and extract knowledge? Let me give you an example. We have access to this set of chest X-ray. There is no value there until we have a particular question. What is going to be the purpose here? So let me give you, for example, an example here. What you can do is say, okay, I, I aim to assist the radiologist. So machine learning, statistical learning, deep learning now, uh, the main objective is not to substitute the expert, is how to make faster decisions. In this case is, okay, how we can do the diagnostic faster and aim the decision with a clinician. Another example, for instance, is we have access not only to fixed data, but also as well as spatiotemporal data like this video. And the main question, what we can do here? Well, 
if we understand the semantics, uh, for instance, semantic segmentation that is here, we can ask questions like how we can improve, make better policies for health through traffic and urban, urban analysis. Uh, so this is some kind of questions do we need to ask how, why, and what. So we can get an extract value of the data. So the problem is that more and more the data is increasing in volume, variety, and uncertainty. And this is some tricky points that I will discuss in the next slide. And the main question here is, okay, we have the data, uh, new algorithmic approach, we need new al algorithmic approach to understand and extract meaningful answers from this data, meaningful patterns to aim a particular purpose, like example that you give you here, like for instance, diagnosis or make better policies. But now, uh, Usually what we do is to have single modality, but now we are in the era of, of multimodal data. What it means that uh, usually we, we take some imaging data and we ask some questions, right? But now, now more and more you realize that actually you have access not only to the imaging data, but also as well to the records. Any type of records that you can have, like for instance, in this example, you have radiology report, but also as well you have access to some blood test, uh, demographics, everything that you can have for the patient. This information is valuable to make the final decision. And this is why we come, and this is some called multimodal data. How we can take the best uh, of both type of data, imaging and non-imaging data, to improve the outcome. So here, what is assuming in, in multimodal data is that you have a modalities. A subset, subset of that will be part of imaging data. Like for instance, if I give you an example, it can be MRI, your microscopic images, etc., or and another subset of uh, this data will be non-imaging data. For example, uh, you can have along with this PET or MRI, you can have some demographics, uh, blood results, etc. So the main question is: once we have this large amount of data, how we can improve uh, the decision on a particular task? And there are different ways to do it. Today, the one that I want to share with you is from a graph perspective. So, and one of the key parts is how we can develop hybrid models. I mean, you will hear during this talk, hybrid models, meaning that from the mathematical point of view, what we can add to deep learning. So we can take the best of all the worlds. Okay, and another key point here is uh, label data. Everyone that works in the medical domain, acquiring a single data, a single label is time consuming. So this opened the door at different paradigms in machine learning, deep learning, that for instance, you have here before, unsupervised learning, for instance, but here, what I want to motivate is semi-supervised learning. So why is this interesting? Because, uh, well, in particular in the medica medical domain, human annotations are expensive and time consuming. They require expert knowledge. So for instance, if, if, if someone asks us to label a cat and dog, we can do it. But if someone gives us a particular sample like draw from hospital, like for instance, this brain, and, and tell us, please annotate where is the tumor, for instance, or in a mammogram, where do you localize the cancer? These require expert knowledge. And, and of course, that comes with a human bias. Um, for example, let me give you an example. Um, for, for example, the mammograms, uh, they, they come to say, okay, we need two readers to give a single label, but sometimes, there's a, a disagreement on this label, so you need to call a third reader. So this is a, a inherent human bias that you add there. So how, to, how you can develop algorithmic approach that works with minimal supervision and handle in a best possible way all these type of data, going from imagining and non-imagining data. And today, the case study that I'm going to share with you is nothing to do with microscopy, yet we work on that as well, but it's more about Alzheimer's disease. So long story short, Alzheimer's disease is a irreversible neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, there is, unfortunately, there is no cure for that, but the main goal is to detect it as soon as possible so the uh, clinician can offer a better, uh, a better treatment and improve the quality of life of the patient. Okay, so what, what, what is happening in uh, now in the new era of deep learning. So there is something that is called the quiet semi-supervised revolution. So uh, semi-supervised is nothing new since uh, has been for many years with a very beautiful theoretical site. And in, but in the past, in the classic perspective, you have something like this. If you, you want performance, that means that you will require large amount of label data. That uh, for instance, this is a blue a line that you're able to see, the blue curve. 
And then if you have tiny level set, the performance will decrease because this prior is not enough. So this is what is so-called semi-supervised learning, and this is a rate curve that you have here. However, in the last years, for instance, to 2017, appears new uh, algorithmic developments where you can merge the theoretical understanding of super semi-supervised learning with deep learning. And this is what is called the quiet semi-supervised revolution that appears recently. So what is happening here now is that semi-supervised you can gain this performance with a tiny label set and is even higher than fully supervised techniques. This is what is called the magic sun. So this is why is now in the era of big data is quite important or interesting to use minimal labeling so develop uh, algorithmic techniques that they have less bias and you propagate that over your algorithmic techniques. So what are the challenges now? So we have key, two keywords here, multimodal analysis and uh, semi-supervised learning. We want to learn with minimal labels here. So the challenges here is that um, how we can exploit better this multimodal data. In the traditional way, you can exploit single modality. You can take any Im image approach, for instance, PET, MRI, microscopy, and do your analysis. And then, uh, but then you realize, as I mentioned before, that you have access to other type of image uh, data, like for instance, uh, blood tests, demographics, or anything related to the information of the patient. So how we can relate this in a very possible way. And with that, I will introduce something that is called hypergraph learning. The main idea of hypergraph learning, unlike typical graph, is that in a graph, you have these pairwise relations. In a hypergraph, you can go in higher order, meaning that some of the uh, data that you have patients might have the same disease, how you can relate not only pairwise, but in higher order, so you can get better relations of your data. I will go more in details about the introduction of hypergraph in the next slide. And, but now we have two approach. We have the classic mathematical uh, way that we can do it, uh, or the statistical learning approach, but also as well we have the new developments of deep learning. So the main question is how we can bring together the best of both worlds. Mathematical modeling can give you understanding, interpretability of your model, whilst deep learning can give you this performance that you are looking for. And in the terms uh, of this talk, I will divide it into two parts, how we can bring together what is so-called the hybrid model and use mathematical modeling, deep learning model uh, to develop what is so-called better functionals. So you can have, uh, for instance, in this case, the diagnosis that is translated in classification uh, as, as accurate or as possible, but at the same time, you can understand what is happening in the model. So what are the going to be the main contributions on main uh, key parts of this uh, talk will be uh, mainly two. We are introducing, we are talking about a new algorithmic approach that we call hypergraph diffusion networks. The main goal here is divided uh, how we can create these hybrid models that can be interpretable, but at the same time, you can compare with pure deep learning techniques. For that, we are going to de uh, design new uh, new algorithmic approach that is mainly based on how we can develop new functionals in the graph, gra graph uh, space. And then from that, the main question is, once we have a graph that is well representative of your data, or hypergraph actually, how we can use deep learning to boost the diagnosis. Uh, again, this, uh, these techniques can be used and scaled to different tasks. Uh, as I mentioned in the very first slide, if you want to do segmentation, unsupervised completely, that's possible. If you want to do uh, also well registration of your data. Uh, of course, in this case, I will, the main task will be classification for diagnosis. But what I want to highlight is that this is not only uh, like limited to diagnosis. You can do even prognosis. You have log temporal or longitudinal data as well. And then uh, towards the talk, uh, the end of this talk, uh, I will share how these algorithmic techniques, this hybrid, hybrid approach works in real world data with uh, Alzheimer patients. Well, not only Alzheimer, I will, I will like uh, explain that uh, we have different division of, of patients. So what is the problem here? So let me uh, formalize a little more. Semi-supervised learning, the main goal is that you have vast amount of data, but only a tiny set of these uh, vast amount of uh, data is labeled. So, and the rest of data that is huge will be unlabeled. So the main, uh, the main task of semi-supervised learning is how we can infer, uh, infer a fun function such that you can uh, estimate as, as, as much or uh, give a good approximation of the huge amount of labeled data using only this tiny label as a prior hopefully with minimum generalization error. So as I mentioned before, one of the key parts here is the hybrid model. So they will be divided in very quickly in, in two, two main parts. 
The first one is how we can um, construct the hypergraph. If we think about social uh, social network, it's naturally created. So you are a friend from another friend, and you can construct this uh, hypergraph or graph. But what's happening in, in your data? This is you need to find a way to construct a, a hypergraph in the best possible way. And this is important because this is depends about your uh, following process. Uh, or the diagnostic, final diagnostic. So generating uh, your hypergraph for this uh, multimodal data is a key point. And the second part is going to be the main, one of the main course here that uh, what we call it hypergraph diffusion models that he ha we have here a, a functional and the main uh, goal of this functional is say, how you can use this tiny prior from the label set because we are in semi-supervised, propagated to the graph and infer the labels for the huge amount of label data. Okay, so I'm talking a lot about uh, hypergraph. Uh, a quick explanation is that if, if you think about a graph, this is a sort of a generalization. A graph, uh, this is pairwise relation, uh, a traditional graph. So you have a node A and B, but in hypergraph, you as well, you have a set of nodes connected with edges, but there is something that is called hyperedge. So what allows to do this hyperedge? This hyperedge will allow you to connect a set of nodes that are also related to another set of nodes. That this, you cannot do it with a traditional uh, graph perspective. And this is a key part of hyper, uh, hypergraph uh, meaning. So what is interesting about this point, because you can have high order relations of the data, meaning that the goal is to extract more meaningful relations and patterns that you can have in your data. Now you have imagining and unimagining data. So the assumption here is that uh, very quickly, as a quick reminder, you have a, a set of, uh, a huge uh, data set. A subset of that is imagining data, like for instance, in this case, PET and MRI together. And another subset is non-imagining data. In this case, related to Alzheimer will be genetics. You have genetics, demographics, etc. So how we can uh, make use of these uh, multimodal data to make better decisions. Okay, the first part is how we can construct the graph. We have this MRI, PET, and we have also as well non-imagining data, how we can uh, relate everything in a, sing in a communal space, that is the hypergraph. So one of the key parts that I want to highlight here is that we want to do it in a such way that uh, when you have a sample uh, that, it, that they have some level of perturbation, the model or the hypergraph will be invariant to that perturbation. Why is this interesting? Because imagine that you have like a PET or MRI, let's say, and then uh, you acquire from a different scanners, scanners from a different hospitals. So the distributions you plotted will be different. So how you can enforce to, to have this, uh, some set of delta perturbations and enforce that your model will not decrease the performance. This is uh, something important that we're looking for when constructing the hypergraph. So uh, to do the first part, there are two parts for here, is that the imagining da data has been very well established how to extract uh, features, many from features, and some of that without labels. And one of the key parts is something that is called contrastive learning. So what is contrastive learning? This is nothing but distinctiveness. So the samples that they draw for the same distribution, you want that these features are close to each other. If, if they are drawn from a different distribution, then will be uh, far away. So this is contrastive learning approach. So you can contrast without labels and then do augmentations uh, of your imaging data to construct the hypergraph. What is the challenge here? The challenge here is that you don't have so, such perturbations in the graph. For instance, if you, are, you want to add some rotation or translation to, to your sample, you cannot do it in a hypergraph. If you translate or rotate, that is not going to have the main meaning that if you do it with the imaging data. So the, the idea that we have here is that, okay, imaging data, to start the first part of this algorithmic approach, we are going to do it with contrastive learning that is widely studied. But when we are dealing with a non-imaging data, for instance, genetics, uh, we cannot perturb it. Why? Because if you alter the semantics of these uh, genetics, you will destroy completely the meaning, what is, what is mean this uh, uh, genetics uh, chain. So what we uh, thought is, okay, we generate a first uh, uh, approximation of the hypergraph, and then once we have the hypergraph for the non-imaging data, then we can apply the perturbations. And these perturbations are different because uh, the perturbations in a hypergraph level will be how many nodes I can remove, and how can many edges, for instance, this is a type of topological uh, perturbations I can remove without affecting the whole uh, graph semantics, uh, the hypergraph semantics that I have constructed. So, and a second part 
Okay, good afternoon. Uh, the second part is once I have this hypergraph, and this is what we introduce, what we call hypergraph diffusion uh, model. I want to clarify before to go to, through this is that there is something in generative models that is called diffusion models. But uh, although we have been working on that, this diffusion model has different meaning. This diffusion model means that it's a phenomenon that happens in the hypergraph or graph. So uh, just to clarify, this is nothing related to the generative AI. So uh, this is just the phenomenon on the hypergraph. So the, the main uh, goal that we have in the mathematical side is that we we develop a uh, novel functional. What it this means? Means that you have now the first step it was constructed hypergraph. Now we have uh, some nodes that are labeled minimal labels because remember we are in semi supervised. So that this this function what is doing is say take this information and use it to propagate it or diffuse it through all the graph and assign uh, initial inference of the labels to the unlabeled nodes. So at the end of the day, you will have which probability belongs each of these nodes that is unlabeled that belongs to a set of predefined classes. So this is what you want to do to, uh, with this function to infer this unlabeled data as, as much as possible this tiny prior. And this is the function what it is, is doing here. And, and this is just a level prior because we are in some supervised set learning. So we need to tell to the algorithmic approach, uh, accommodate in this optimization that you have, this uh, tiny level set that we have and use it as a weight, as a diffusion of the function that I had before. So this is uh, the long story short about these hypergraph diffusion models. But so far is the mathematical side. I, I mentioned about hybrid models, how we can elevate the performance uh, to be at the same level of pure deep learning models. So the, the idea comes as follows. Uh, there is something in semi-supervised learning. Well, very quickly, semi-supervised learning, they have a broad family, can be perturbation-based methods, generative models, graph-based techniques, pseudo-label techniques, that is perhaps one of the most popular. And pseudo-label means that uh, how you can infer, uh, initially give, assign a fake label to the unlabeled data, and then check how certain is this label. So this is what is called pseudo-label. So the first paper comes from pseudo-labeling, uh, the idea in 2013. And the main idea is saying, what we can generate the pseudo-labels directly for the deep network. So for us, we say, we don't want to do that. Uh, the way to do the pseudo-labeling will be through the diffusion model. And this is where the mathematical approach comes to fusioning with deep learning. And the idea is as follows. We construct the hypergraph, and then the function that I mentioned before, that is the diffusion of the process, uh, we are using to generate pseudo labels, meaning that at a certain point uh, in the first interaction, you will have for each uh, unlabeled point, an initial um, label. The problem is here, there is so something that is called pseudo labeling bias, meaning that it's highly uncertain that this, at the first instance, this label is highly uh, certain, meaning that if you continue with the training process over the epochs, this error will be propagated. What we can do? And this is uh, improving uh, something that is called uncertainty. How we can we check if the uncertainty is good enough to update the label? So let's let's go here. We have the hypergraph. Initialize the network with a tiny label set that you have. Run the diffusion model that is the mathematical side. Add the pseudo label is in the hypergraph. Return to the hypergraph and check for the uncertainty with a uh, with the lost and do it over a, a set of uh, iterations. And this is what we call hypergraph diffusion models. So how it works, uh, how it works in, let me show you. So this is experimental results. And what we use is uh, Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative data set. And we consider 500 patients. And for imaging data, we have MRI, PET, demographics. Um, now the demographic is non-imaging data and the genetics. That is something that is called APOE. And for the, uh, this is diagnostic. So this translating in classification. So we have four classes. That is uh, uh, healthy, Alzheimer, uh, MCI, and late uh, uh, LMCI. That is uh, the late uh, mild cognitive impairment. So the main task here is uh, first we we want to have binary and multi-class classification. Here is the is our approach against uh, other hypergraph deep learning approach that exists. And you might ask why you have a graph neural network instead of hypergraph here because this approach was able to uh, embed. Um, like the imagining and non-imagining data in the graph, not in the hypergraph. So we can compare again, uh, how is the game between a typical graph and hypergraph. And these other approach are uh, hypergraph, diffusion, uh, hypergraph networks that are deep learning approach and ours. 
So what, what is, uh, we showed at the beginning that only with a 15% of label data of the data set, we can um, outperform existing approach. I will give you an interpretation about why is this happening in a few. And one interesting part is that there is something that is called late MCI and Alzheimer. If you take a look about the features of that, it's really hard to discriminate. And if we take care very careful about the uncertainty of the assignation labels, you will see that uh, this is where also our approach works very well. So, of course, you don't want to do a binary classification. You want to drop all the data that you have with a pre of set, set of predefined classes and do the classification. And this is uh, in terms of error rate. So in the multi-class case also as well, we perform very well. So wh why, why is this happening? And or, um, our explanation for that is that these hi uh, hybrid models, you have the mathematical side and the deep learning side where the mathematical side, we know what is happening. So you have some interpretability in the model. Uh, you know that you can, for instance, uh, uh, like do something that you can do with the deep learning that is, okay, this model I can show in the strict sense that converge to a steady step uh, state. What you cannot do it in, uh, for instance, in, in, a, uh, in, in deep learning alone. So and this kind of uh, interpretability along with uncertainty that is coming from the deep learning part helps us to the hybrid model to have better accuracy, or better performance in the model. So one of the questions is, okay, the, uh, the, there are two main contributions. So there is the dual strategy, how do you construct the, uh, the spaces for the non-imagining and imagining data and the uncertainty scheme that is come from the deep learning part and we show that actually both of them, they have a positive influence in the final performance. Uncertainty is a keyword. You are segmenting as well. If you are doing reconstruction, if you are doing any task, uncertainty, I will say this is also as well a key part in your algorithmic approach when you develop. Even if it's a classic perspective of deep learning, uncertainty, particularly in deep learning, I believe that uncertainty is really key in the algorithmic development. And also as well, uh, our other question is, really you need multimodal data. You cannot run it as in other papers that you have single modality. And we show actually that multimodal data benefits because you can extract different features that you cannot see in a, in a different modality. And all together, you can show that actually the performance benefits uh, uh, in, in this particular case study. Um, and another question that we have uh, usually is, what about you increase your label rate? You have semi-supervised, you have 15% of label data or 5%, what about you increase more? So in, uh, in the classic perspective of semi-supervised, they, they will reach a point because semi-supervised is designed different the function that you have for supervised approach. Supervised approach is designed to uh, deal with this per data, that is uh, the label with a sample, but Semi-supervised is mainly about how you handle better than label data. So if you want to increase uh, uh, the label set, you will lose this definitional concept of semi-supervised. And the performance, of course, will reach a point where you cannot see a major improvement on that. So what I want to uh, close my, my presentation today uh, is that um, I, we, today we present hypergraph diffusion models, and this is hybrid approach. So uh, we want to solve problems that they are mathematically uh, interesting, but at the same time, we can use deep learning uh, techniques to boost the performance. Um, and another key part is that we have not only, we can give explainability, but also as well interpretability uh, in the algorithmic approach. And our main goal here is to continue developing these hybrid models, but also, again, as I mentioned before, we are only not doing classification uh, we are doing also as well, for instance, if you want to segment, segment completely without labels on supervised segmentation, you can take a look about as well or, or works. And of course, uh, multimodal data is a key one because if you take a look about um, the deep learning area, vision, language models is now something that is increasing interest. So with that, I would like to thank uh, again the organizer for having me here and hopefully I'm exactly on time. Thank you. Thank you. seconds to spare. Um, we haven't got time for questions, so we're going to, I'd like to just thank Angelica. Thank, thank you, you so much. And we'll move on to...